of the status quo um, may be successful in, in characterizing this critical approach as, ro as attempts to rob Peter to pay Paul, in other words, to take the funds that have been um, devoted to their needs and to shift them to other needs without paying enough attention, frankly, to the needs of the, uh, of the farming community. I think a better case for reform, and, and the one that Ford and I tried to make in, in our paper on farm policy, can be advanced by pointing to the changing realities in rural America. Um, <clears throat> what are some of those realities? First, agriculture clearly has become a great deal more specialized than it was uh, 75 years ago. Among other things, this means that two-thirds of U.S. farm out output is now outside of the reach of commodity programs. Second, agriculture no longer is, as it was 75 years ago, the engine uh, of the rural economy. Both service industries and manufacturing industries provide many times as many rural jobs uh, as does agriculture. Third, <clears throat> most families that are classified by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as farming have incomes well above the national average for American households in general and well above the average of rural non-farm incomes. Fourth, in spite of pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into farm programs over the last 25 years, rural incomes have eroded uh, from 80 percent of metro incomes 25 years ago to about two-thirds of urban earnings today. Uh, fifth, <clears throat> new technologies like biotechnology and new opportunities like uh, product differentiation moving away from um, commodities, uh, exports and distributed energy production make commodity programs largely irrelevant to uh, farming's future however relevant they've been to the past. And finally, new priorities like conserving land, water, and wildlife um, and ending hunger in America deserve to move from the periphery of the farm policy agenda to the center. So all of this suggests to me a fairly simple conclusion. Whatever their value in the past, commodity programs are not the path to a prosperous future for farmers or for their rural neighbors. Farm policy does not need tweaking at the edges. It does need fundamental reform. So what are the prospects for that reform? <coughs> Excuse me. At one point, I think many of us believe that 2007 would provide a unique opportunity for fundamental reform. It would be driven by dwindling budgetary resources in the face of more claimants, making more of the same, if you wish, simply not good enough. But I think events are conspiring against this kind of f fundamental change. Uh, for example, the Bush administration's farm bill, it should be congratulated for introducing one. Uh, it's been several administrations since that has happened. And while their bill is directionally <coughs> correct, um, I'm afraid uh, it's fairly timid in terms of uh, the kinds of reforms that are needed. Farm 21 uh, broached some more far-reaching changes but there is, I think, a very real risk as some of those may erode under the pressure to collect votes um, that might otherwise go to the proposals that are coming out of the um, two agriculture committees. Um, <coughs> traditional commodity interests and their congressional allies are playing, I think we have to say, a very good game of killing reform with a thousand cuts. Uh, things like being willing to talk about lower eligibility criteria, uh, tighter payment limitations, uh, the on block amendment that basically takes uh, conservation and nutrition and energy programs and puts them in a second tier um, that is contingent on finding reserves to finance them. Uh, all of these uh, things are shifting the debate from changes in kind to changes in degree. Um, and finally, the legislative process itself seems to me to be conspiring against reform. The Ag Committees oppose it and haven't given it a real hearing. Uh, the legislative calendar is very crowded, uh, probably too crowded to allow an informed floor debate on change. And delay in it itself in taking the Farm Bill up uh, is likely to make a simple extension look 
um, ever more appealing as time passes. Well, it would be a shame for the genuine interest that is built up in farm policy reform to be defeated by this kind of inertia and politics rather than by deliberations and evidence. So um, I want to raise the possibility of uh, reform interests thinking about a plan B. Now, what would that plan B or that alternative strategy um, look like? I think the first step in any alternative strategy is not to lose ground in today's political conflicts. If it appears, and I still think it's fair to say if it appears, that Congress is likely to pass something more like the 2002 Farm Act, reformers should try and attach two addendums um, to that kind of an extension. The first would be a firm two-year sunset, so that it is only a two-year extension. And the second would be to repeal uh, the 1949 Farm Act, so-called permanent legislation. The idea behind these suggestions is to say that in 2009, we will have a genuine debate about farm policy reform and that we will work off of a fairly clean slate, not an inherited uh, structure and the, and the threat of going back to something that clearly is irrelevant to um, all of modern agriculture. Second, I think reformers need to reposition their case for reform. Um, in fact, I think uh, reformers have missed an opportunity to present proposals that are better for farmers and for other rural constituents than what the members of the Ag, committee, uh, ag Committees are offering. What would such a new <coughs> vision of agricultural policy look like? This is what uh, Ford and I have tried to uh, lay out in, in the paper that uh, you have. But let me try and summarize it uh, very quickly. There are about 300,000 or so large commercial farmers. Uh, they do not need income supports as they are already generally highly profitable. They also don't benefit net-net um, from programs that are pushing up land costs and land rents because this curbs their ability to enter new areas, to expand, and frankly, to, to com compete globally uh, as their costs rise artificially. What they do need, however, are tools to manage the risks that are inherent in farming. Most of this can be actuarially sound, privately delivered risk management tools if government would simply get out of the way. But in order to help those markets those private markets develop, it may be necessary for government to provide some um, assistance going forward in, the, in creating um, new risk management systems. There are another 1.5 million so-called farmers who in fact earn their incomes from non-farm sources and receive little or nothing uh, from existing commodity program payments. But what they need are increased public funds flowing to rural areas through rural institutions, not urban ones, that are to be invested in public goods, uh, infrastructure for education, health care, sanitation, transportation, communications, the kinds of things that you need if you want to reverse that widening rural, in rural urban income gap and, and begin to close it by leveling the competitive playing field between urban and rural areas. Finally, there are about 300,000 farmers who are too small to be profitable or helped by commodity program payments, uh, but too large to earn adequate incomes from off-farm sources. Um, what they need, really need is federally funded adjustment assistance. This would be designed to enable these in-betweeners to either to become commercially viable or to find good jobs off the farm to support their families. I think something like this sort of a differentiated strategy um, is important in addressing the changing realities in rural areas as well as what many of the reform allies want to free up resources to be invested in, in other priorities. Third, um, I think the reform community needs to reconnect farm policy reform with trade policy reform. The United States is a nation of laws that needs a rule-based <coughs> trading system. U.S. agriculture currently serves a very well-fed domestic market and needs access to a growing global market. 
These two needs, a rule-based trading system that is serving growing offshore demand, are best achieved if our negotiators um, are able to push boldly for reform. Today that's not the case. Today they are trapped ambivalently pushing for improved market access on the one hand while trying to defend uh, our rights to um, maintain trade distorting programs on the other. And if we had a farm bill proposal um, um, like the one that, that I described to you in, in the Rungi Johnson paper, they would be freer to, um, to pursue a bolder approach. So to summarize uh, my comments, we think this strategy would produce a better outcome um, for farmers and non-farmers alike. It would require the reform community um, to use the next two years wisely to develop well-vetted proposals. One can't go into 2009 no better prepared than, than we might have been in 2007. We need to have the firm sunset um, so that there is a um, clean slate, if you wished, uh, on which to write new policy. And we need to develop uh, effective risk management tools, good sound strategies for investing in public goods benefiting rural areas, and a meaningful adjustment um, program for those who um, need to make change. And if we do that, I think we will free up um, the trade negotiators' hands to pursue the kind of ambitious outcome in Doha uh, that would make uh, extension of TPA authority uh, more appealing. I'll stop there. Okay, I, I guess maybe I should ask first, are there any questions of clarification for Robin before I kind of change the focus to biofuels? I think we'll be coming back, but you know. You want to take a question? Deference to Robin, I thought if someone had a, an issue they wanted to raise, we could. Please, there's a lady right there. We'll get a microphone to you. Does, does this work? Yes, it does, That's actually. Well it is. I'm normally loud enough anyway. If you could introduce yourself. Certainly. My name's Mary Chambliss. Uh, I'm an independent consultant with several groups in town, the World Food Program, uh, Bread for the World, some of those folks. Um, when you mentioned the idea of next step, it, uh, it just happened by coincidence to be uh, talking with someone this weekend about the uh, dim prospects for any real reform on the farm bill, and I agree they're extremely dim. And he was raising, I have to assume from his past experience, the uh, model of the commission that was set up, um, I want to say in the 80s, maybe, maybe in the 80s, on Social Security, where Congress was unable for various and sundry political reasons to make the kind of changes that many members might have wanted to, and that, that could be a similar situation now. And he was just wondering, and we were talking with some other folks, the idea would a commission like that of outside experts, I'm probably looking at several right now, uh, and a two-year time frame, I agree with you, certainly no more than a two-year extension because they're going to be tempted to do five, and the idea of getting rid of the 49 Act is just wonderful. Um, anyway, I was just curious uh, your reaction to that kind of an idea and if it might be worth some people pursuing. Thank um, you. Thank you very much for the idea, Mary. Um, I think it's a good idea. You know, there was a National Food and Fiber Commission back in the 60s, I, th I think it was, that, that came up with some very good ideas at a time when farm policy had to change directions. Um, I, the so-called Williams Commission in the early 70s uh, helped launch an international trade negotiation that was um, very different in scope than previous ones. So I, yes, I think the idea of a commission of outsiders, yeah, right. not not of people representing um, uh, mem uh, constituencies, uh, would be a useful one. Thank you. Charlotte, Maybe, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry, Charlotte Kevin Brand from the IBC. Rob, just politically speaking, given that the the politics are so intense on on Congress right now. We, if we push it off for two years, we've got presidential elections. What's the likelihood of, of anybody agreeing to a sunset by then? And, and you know, do you think the debate is going to be that the environment is going to be any easier in two years from now than it is now? Well, that could either be a long answer or a short answer, I guess. <laughs> um, my my premise is uh, our premise is is essentially this that um, there is strong genuine interest in reform that is going to be frustrated, I think, by the processes as it plays out. But it is going to be able, I think, 
to demand some kind of accounting, and I think that's where the sunset ideas um, play out. Um, whether we can then organize that interest collectively to use the, the next two years wisely um, is a more open question. I like the idea of a commission as one way of, of providing focus on that, and, and that might provide just the focus that's needed. Ford, did you want to add something? Well, just uh, maybe, maybe our chronology isn't clear. We intend this, to, this, this revisitation to occur post-election. Post the Iowa caucuses. Yes. I guess following on a bit of Ann Tutwiler, um, <laughs> sorry, Charlotte's question. Um, if the ref a reform effort fails this time, um, given the head of steam that's been built up and the editorial drumbeat that's been out there, um, how much does that sort of feed the myth that these programs are invincible and make it harder <coughs> to come back in two years? And, and I guess this is a trade-off we look at in Doha and, and any number of other places is, is it better to grasp what you can, even if it's not as much as you would like, even in this current Farm Bill debate, and come back to fight another day, or say, we're just going to put this off till we can get something more meaningful in two years, or try to get something well, more meaningful. Well, well, clearly that's the kind of discussion that the people in this room need to have. Um, what we were trying to say in the second point that I was making in our alternative strategy is that the reform community has to make good use of this two-year period to not um, refine their ideas for how funds could be recoupled to their priorities, but how to deal with legitimate needs um, for income support or risk management tools that exist in the farm community. And I think too much of the reform initiative has been based on criticizing what exists and not enough on, and okay, how would you make it work better? And I think that's where the reform community needs to make some progress. Why don't we uh, stop the questions there? We'll return. I've got a list uh, of questions <coughs> I've been jotting down myself, and, and Rob will come back to that. Um, after our other two presentations. Ford, why don't you take us in a slightly different direction? Okay. And maybe we'll take a couple questions after that and then move to, to Bill and his uh, more detailed look at the Farm Bill. All right. Thank you. Well, Kent, uh, first I must say that I think the Regents and Administration of the University of Minnesota would want me to state <laughs> that uh, I'm on the faculty there. Uh, not at Wisconsin, although I was Did trained I say in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Oh, I well, I grew up there, and Badger. Maybe something happened that you don't know. About. Well, let me just say that here Badger. I watch the Mary, T Mary Tyler Moore show all the time Perhaps too. So. Badger, though I might have been a gopher, am I now? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let me uh, let me uh, develop the uh, ideas that Rob and I have worked out in connection with the uh, the biofuels question. Several months ago, I was here, and some of you perhaps were in attendance, uh, to talk about uh, the biofuels situation, and I described it as a situation that may be upsetting. Uh, I described a variety of sort of untoward possibilities and uh, realities that uh, were uh, in process uh, leading to the rationing of uh, corn and uh, other grains uh, for food versus fuel use. And since that time, an uh, article was published based on that in Foreign Affairs in May-June. Uh, I think that there's been quite a bit of attention to the food versus fuel uh, question. Uh, environmental groups, uh, commodity groups, uh, hunger groups, and others have become increasingly aware of how acutely uh, the demand for corn rising above 20 percent of our corn crop is cutting into its uh, possible use for other purposes and having cascading effects throughout commodities markets. But my intent, our intent today, is not to be uh, critical but constructive, to ask how we might go from where we are now uh, toward uh, a more well-balanced uh, and uh, less distorting uh, set of energy policies, uh, linked as they must be because we're discussing biofuels uh, to some of the agricultural policy initiatives uh, that uh, Robin has uh, outlined. 
And the first thing I want to say is that I think it's very important for people who are not sort of up to their ears in ethanol, as I am, uh, to appreciate that we are coming to a kind of uh, watershed. Uh, for some time, the possibility that ethanol could function as a substitute um, for uh, lead-based uh, additives in gasoline and as an oxygenate in substitution for MTBE, uh, which was uh, outlawed uh, in relation to its impacts on groundwater quality, have created a kind of a niche for ethanol. That niche is now nearly full. And when it becomes full, the situation in the ethanol market will change. It's already begun to change. Ethanol is now trading at a discount. Uh, and the reason is because it is no longer really a value-added product. It is a commodity. And that is a very important shift uh, in the characteristics of this market. <clears throat> and so, as a result, there are a number of basic questions that confront the biofuels industry, which for the most part have not come to the surface. First, is ethanol likely to command a premium, or will it face a discount into the future? Second, will ethanol usage increase corn and soybean demand or will it divert demand from food to fuel uses? So this is the food versus fuel uh, dilemma. Third, should ethanol's role in farm policy, linking back to what Robin has said, continue to be uh, a vent for surplus? Or should it be treated as part of an energy portfolio? We don't have a corn surplus in this country today. We are running at uh, what an old grain trader like Robin would call bottom of the bin, uh, or I would say bare shelf uh, inventories. Uh, we don't have carry forwards uh, in corn, and we won't have because ethanol is taking up the slack. And so uh, what's happening is that the ethanol component of demand is imposing these trade-offs in relation to its use for other purposes. And finally, should ethanol, in particular corn-based ethanol, continue to be favored, or should we seek a more level playing field uh, with other petroleum substitutes? And that gets us into the question of cellulosic alternatives and the like. Now let me make just a few remarks, and then I want to go to some of the policy proposals that uh, Robin and I outline in our paper. But let me first say that the competitive position of the biofuels industry has never been tested. The reason for this is because of the panoply of subsidies and mandates operating in the sector today. There currently is a 51 cent a gallon blender's credit, which the market effectively passes through into the price of corn. There is also a 54 cent a gallon import tariff which is applicable primarily to uh, our main competitor, uh, Brazil and Brazilian sugar-based ethanol, uh, designed to keep this lower cost uh, source of ethanol <coughs> from domestic markets. Uh, and uh, finally, there are mandates uh, currently in place uh, which uh, require uh, renewable fuels uh, to uh, rise progressively in use to 7.5 billion gallons by 2012. So providing a guaranteed market uh, for these fuels uh, at that level. Now I said 7.5 billion gallons uh, by 2012. In his State of the Union message, the President asked that the mandate be raised to 35 billion gallons of renewable fuels by 2017. The morning after the State of the Union address, having nothing better to do, I calculated <clears throat> that if that mandate were fully satisfied with corn-based ethanol, it would require 108 percent of current corn production. All of it, plus 8 percent. No corn for hogs, no corn for pigs, no corn for beef cattle, no corn for dairy cattle, no corn for corn flakes, no corn for anything but ethanol. And I think that that illustrates fairly clearly that the presence of these mandates and their ratcheting upward aggravates this enormous rationing problem uh, that uh, we've discussed. And so when I come back to our policy proposals, you'll see that f first and foremost amongst them is to call a pause in the escalation of these mandates 
to take some of the pressure off of these markets. Um, the ethanol market to date has had the effect, as intended, of enlarging the demand for U.S. corn. But now, the disappearance of corn, consequent to the boom in ethanol, is creating a supply squeeze. Uh, it has pushed corn prices as high as 4.25 a bushel in April. Uh, the response, the supply response, was uh, an increase in planting intentions announced in the same month of 15 percent in U.S. Uh, corn to be planted this spring, 12 million acres in total, the largest corn acreage since 1944, and we're still running with bare shelves. Of that 12 million acre increase in corn production, approximately 9 million will come from soybeans and approximately 3 million will come from the Conservation Reserve Program. As you convert acres from corn-soybean rotations to continuous corn, you lose the nitrogen that the soybeans have fixed and you must apply substantial amounts of nitrogen to the corn to maintain your yields. We know that the proximate cause of the hypoxic zone, the dead zone of the Gulf of Mexico, are excessive nitrogen loadings, primarily above the confluence of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. The result of these shifts in crop acreage will be to substantially aggravate that environmental uh, difficulty and problem. So the diversion has already begun. I should say parenthetically, if someone tells you that we'll solve this problem by planting switchgrass, ask yourself what farmer in their right mind would plant switchgrass when corn is selling at $3.50 a bushel? The, uh, the uh, operator of a ethanol plant in Marshall, Minnesota, told me that he had actually tried to figure out how much switchgrass he'd need to convert his plant. And he figured it out. It would require a semi-trailer load of switchgrass to pull up to his plant every six minutes, 24 hours a day. It's a lot of switchgrass. And uh, as far as I know, apart from a few isolated plots uh, growing in various parts of western Minnesota, it's not out there. And it's not going to be out there as long as the price of corn is at 350. Um, so. Ethanol has played an important short-term role in filling gaps in the U.S. transportation fuel uh, market, uh, but it is beginning now to create many distortions, and these have been brushed aside. This is changing. Its effect on food prices, especially in poor countries, as well as on prices of milk, eggs, poultry, uh, beef, and pork uh, here at home, are building political attention and resistance. And its net environmental effects are now surfacing, including an effect which I didn't mention a minute ago, which just to produce and convert ethanol, uh, corn to ethanol, uh, requires about three gallons of water for every gallon of ethanol produced. It's enormously consumptive uh, of water resources. So as these problems become clearer, politicians, I think intuitively recognizing that something has to give, have shifted their attention to the idea that we can use cellulosic alternatives. Generally that means switchgrass. Probably, well, I'm quite sure that it's the first time the word switchgrass entered the State of the Union message. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, also uh, wood chips uh, and other uh, sources of uh, cellulosic uh, energy. Now apart from the logistical problems that I pointed out a minute ago and the difficulty in convincing farmers to uh, plant uh, switchgrass, Probably the single most important thing to recognize here in Washington, which I don't probably need to tell you, is that the corn and soybean lobbies haven't spent 30 years paying the campaign bills of uh, Senator, former Senators Daschle and Dole and others uh, to give this game away to grass. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there is no American Switchgrass Growers Association with offices on K Street. Uh, so uh, the uh, idea uh, that this uh, conversion is going to occur readily and uh, willingly on the part of the existing and entrenched lobbies, I think, is uh, fiction. So the question then becomes, where do we go from here? And uh, Robin and I uh, have uh, devised a set of proposals which fall short of pulling the plug on ethanol subsidies and uh, tariffs. Uh, primarily because we think that that would be unsustainable 
politically, and partly because, frankly, the ethanol industry is so far over-invested and over-extended today that if you eliminated the blender's credit and the tariff overnight, the industry would collapse. It is now reliant on those subsidies for its uh, continuance. However, that doesn't mean that they can't be adjusted downward. Ethanol promotion has been accomplished primarily through these subsidies and tariffs together with the mandates that I mentioned. The mandates have been particularly disruptive to uh, both food and fuel markets and we believe should be uh, set where they are and held there uh, for a period of time somewhat analogous to our proposals on farm policy to allow us to take stock and inventory and determine where we are rather than ratcheting up the mandates uh, from the 7.5 billion gallons where they lie now uh, toward the kind of stratosphere that the President proposed in his State of the Union message. In addition to uh, eliminating the mandates uh, increases, uh, we propose a specific mechanism which is a counter-cyclical subsidy or blender's credit to the industry which is designed to vary or fluctuate inversely with the price of corn. There are two basic prices that make ethanol profitable or unprofitable. The price of corn and the price of oil. If the price of corn is low, ethanol is profitable if the price of oil is sufficiently high. If the price of oil is high, ethanol is profitable because it enters as a substitute. The lower the price of oil, and the higher the price of corn, the less profitable ethanol is. Our proposal, which differs slightly from some that have been floated to, pr to provide a countercyclical payment based on the price of oil, is to peg the countercyclical payment to the price of corn. As corn prices fall, blenders' credits would rise. As corn prices rise, blenders' credits would fall. The key question, of course, is where do you set the peg that determines where prices rise and fall <coughs> and what level? Uh, Robin and I have concluded, uh, based on more on experience, uh, I suspect, than uh, econometric analysis, that a reasonable equilibrium price for corn in this new era is probably somewhere between $2.75 and $3.25 a bushel. So if one took the midpoint of that range and set uh, the countercyclical payment at $3 a bushel, it would imply that current prices, Friday's futures were at $3.52, um, you would uh, effectively be paying no blender's credit uh, of $0.51 cents at all. But that's a matter for negotiation. Um, and uh, the result of this mechanism would, it, would be that it would preserve incentives to use corn for fuel exactly when you would want to use it, when it's cheap, and in surplus. But when it's expensive and scarce, you would not be rationing corn for fuel uses when its higher and better uses are for food uh, and feed. I hope that logic is clear, but if not, I'll review it with you uh, afterward. Um, and uh, we believe that this would assist not only in reducing some of the distortions that are being created, but it would actually improve the stability and predictability of the corn ethanol industry's capacity to function and would have the effect of smoothing out what are now very unnerving gyrations in raw commodity product usage for the food industry and the feed industry. This would have the overall effect of stabilizing prices in the food industry, the feed industry, and the ethanol industry. In addition, we have several other proposals relating to energy policy but let me just state them broadly by saying we think that it's been a mistake to play political favorites by favoring corn-based ethanol to the degree that we have. We believe that we should create incentives for research and innovation in the development of biofuels, including cellulosic alternatives, as well as other uh, innovations uh, relating to the use of different natural resources, whether they be wood chips or uh, the exploitation of our abundant coal resources, and in particular, serious efforts to encourage conservation of energy. And that this, be, this general approach should reflect a broad portfolio of energy alternatives in which corn-based ethanol is only one, only one, 
uh, of the alternatives to be pursued. At the moment, even in the case of cellulosic alternatives, uh, the federal policy of providing major grants to six pilot project plants for cellulose really has the effect of paying down at the end of the production process the difference between their costs of production and the uh, competitive market cost that they would need to meet in order to get out and compete. And we think that this is wrong-headed. Instead of paying down the cost of their inefficiency, we should be putting that money at the front end into research and development, into enzyme conversion and other technologies that will actually improve the efficiency and lower the cost of the exploitation of these cellulosic alternatives. So a broad-based energy strategy based on level and lower uh, levels of support. So to recapitulate, stop the increases in mandates where they are and review our policies. Secondly, develop a counter-cyclical blender's credit subsidy inversely related to the price of corn. And thirdly, develop a broad energy portfolio in which we stop trying to pick winners and instead create incentives, especially for research and development, into lowering the costs of energy production and improving our capacity as a nation to conserve energy wherever we can. So that concludes my kind of thumbnail sketch of that part of our analysis. And I'm, I, you know, if you have some brief questions or clarification, I'll be happy to answer them and then we can go on. Yes, sir. You could introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Don Crane with the International Fertilizer Development Center. Uh, you, you talked about uh, corn hasn't met the market test yet. What about um, ethanol from sugarcane in Brazil? Is that, uh, is that market viable? Well, I'll, I'll ask uh, Robin to comment, too, if he'd like. Um, I don't have the numbers in my head or in front of me, but it's clear that the cost of production of sugar-based ethanol in Brazil are substantially lower than corn-based ethanol here. Probably the best rough estimate of the difference in the cost of production is 54 cents because that's the, <coughs> that's the value of the, uh, of the import tariff. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it's clear, to me at least, that Brazil has a comparative advantage uh, in the production of ethanol. And then if you believe, as I do, in exploiting the principle of comparative advantage, we should reduce that import tariff and allow Brazilian ethanol uh, into our markets. Even if we do it on a kind of uh, uh, emergency basis to take some of the heat off this, uh, off this white hot uh, situation that's quickly developing uh, in the corn market. I didn't say a thing about yields or weather. But I don't have to tell you that it's been extremely hot from Washington south. There's not a lot of corn you know, in the scheme of things grown in Georgia and Alabama and North and South Carolina, although there is some corn grown in those states. But I can tell you that in Minnesota and Iowa, subsoil moisture is running right at the edge. We're on bare shelves in that sense, too. We're getting, have gotten so far, timely rains. But we have very little margin to work with. And if we were to see a 10 or 15 percent shortfall in production in relation to normal yields, and normal yields are the basis on which almost all the projections for prices are based, the situation that I've described uh, would am be amplified to the point that I would anticipate that we might see $6 corn uh, over a period of a few months. Just a, a note on Brazil, when uh, I was in Brazil about a year and a half ago, asked a number of people about their ethanol program. They indicated that at $35 a barrel for a, a, a barrel of imported oil, that ethanol was competitive. But they really have an entire system in place the perhaps the result of having had a military government which ran the entire distribution system. They mandated, the government mandated, that every uh, gas station would have an ethanol pump. We're a long way from that. They've, uh, they also didn't break down their advantage with regard to labor costs, which would be much lower in Brazil. So, but and they land, land costs. And land costs also are much, uh, much lower. And they've done a lot with, ex with traditional means of developing improved strands of sugarcane, which are adapted to different parts of Brazil. So they've done a lot of the right things uh, with regard to ethanol. Let well, me let just me add one. Yes, I'm sorry, Rob. 
Brazil's a nice model because when sugar prices are high, um, sugar cane goes into sugar rather than into ethanol, and when sugar prices are low, it tends to shift more into ethanol. It's had an interesting stabilizing effect on uh, world sugar prices, um, too, and it's it's not a bad conceptual model for what we were thinking about in creating a variable subsidy with respect <coughs> to corn prices and ethanol. We take one last question uh, for uh, Dan Pearson with the U.S. International Trade Commission. I may have misunderstood what you're talking about with your countercyclical incentive for production of eth ethanol, but did you describe it such that as the corn price falls, the amount of the subsidy gets larger, or or was it the other way around? Uh, maybe I misspoke. I mean, you spoke correct. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just slow to understand. Well, so, in, in other words, you would set up the incentive <laughs> such that the, so the profitability the, what, what, of producing ethanol would get much greater as the price of corn falls, because you have both the the corn price effect increasing the profitability plus government shoveling some money in there to make it even more profitable. But then the, the actual description of it, is that counter-cyclical or pro-cyclical? Because is, is it, is it <laughs> pushing the, the... Well, I guess it depends on whether you're referring to the price of corn or the price of ethanol. Well, there, I, I think the point that you're missing, Dan, is that you have to pay a certain price in order to get rid of the subsidy when, when corn supplies are tight. Yeah, and so what we are trying to do is to create an incentive system that allows food and feed to compete on an um, equal footing with fuel uses when supplies are modest to tight. And in order to make that work and still be friendly, if you wish, to ethanol development long term, I think there has to be an incentive to the notion that when productivity responds to high prices and stocks build up, that there is something to cushion the shock on the downside too. So that's the notion. Okay. <laughs> Just in, in 1996, when we had quite high corn prices, we had significant reductions in ethanol production because it was no longer profitable. There was no change in the subsidy. I mean, the, the incentive was level throughout that time. And so he, I'm, I'm just a little bit surprised that you've got a system here where the, the subsidy changes are going to absolutely magnify whatever the market is doing to the profitability of ethanol production. I think, I think Think about it for a while, and we'll talk offline. Okay. That actually doesn't have that effect. We'll return to uh, ethanol. Well, well, let me actually problem. let me add something here, though. <clears throat> let me let me add something here. <laughs> One of the things that we're most concerned about is that as the pressure, uh, you know, I mentioned that we're now going to use over 20 percent of our corn crop this year for ethanol, and it's hard to know, but uh, but conservative projections suggest that <laughs> that may ramp up to 25 or 30 percent within a year or two. And some people have said we could use half our corn crop in a few years for ethanol. Um, you know, as these pressures build uh, and the ethanol business itself becomes less and less profitable as a consequence, uh, ethanol producers uh, really uh, have face a fairly stark uh, set of questions. The first thing that that whole run-up in prices will do is far from generating energy self-reliance, as I've said much to their annoyance to the corn growers, they better get on a plane to Saudi Arabia and make sure that OPEC keeps ratcheting up oil prices because as corn prices go up, the only thing that's going to save them is higher and higher oil prices. Alternatively, they better get to Washington and demand increases in mandates so that the mandates essentially create artificial demand for the ethanol, notwithstanding the cost of producing it. Both of those seem to us to be rather odd outcomes of policy, uh, to uh, continue to ratchet up mandates on the one hand or alternatively to uh, cheerlead for OPEC uh, to continue to increase prices doesn't strike us as any way to run a railroad. We'll return to this subject, I suspect, uh, when we get to the broader discussion period. Let's turn now to, to Bill Crist, and I want to <coughs> stress uh, how much Really, I'm in awe of Bill, who, as you saw, has an enormous background in trade and trade policy, but really almost entirely on the industrial side. He has now plunged himself into the farm bill to the extent that you'd think he had his own ranch down in Crawford. Bill? 
Thanks, Kent. I, I do have a, a good-sized garden, but that's about it. From, from Kent's initial introduction of me, I wasn't quite sure whether I was on the far left or the far right. I, I like to think about that talking about trade policy in the Farm Bill is, is actually kind of in the middle. Um, in, in looking at this issue of trade policy and the, and the Farm Bill, I think it's important to begin by just emphasizing that uh, the Farm Bill really needs to be based on U.S. national economic interest, and particularly as that relates to uh, farm community in rural America. Having said that, um, I would argue that the 2007 Farm Bill is probably the biggest uh, piece of trade legislation this year that Congress is going to have to deal with. Um, it's a lot bigger than the Korean Free Trade Agreement and with the uh, Trade Promotion Authority off of the table. I think this is, this is really a big issue for the trade policy community. And basically, I, I did this paper because I, I didn't think that trade policy was being <coughs> adequately considered in um, either by the trade policy community of what the Farm Bill might mean for them or in the, in the development of the Farm Bill. So let me just make a couple of quick brief comments about um, agriculture and trade policy and then talk about implications of trade policy for the Farm Bill and then flip that over and look at implications of the Farm Bill for trade policy. In a broad context, of course, uh, since World War II, we've had eight trade negotiations that have virtually eliminated uh, trade barriers on industry with a, a huge increase in trade. And we have a, a trade system that's with rules that are really well defined. By contrast, agriculture was only really first substantively addressed in the last round, the Uruguay round which I think made a really good start in developing rules for agricultural trade, but much more minimal on uh, trade liberalization. <clears throat> One thing that's really important about that is that, is that the U.S. was the driver of those rules, uh, and it, they were driven by U.S. negotiators because they thought it, they were in our national economic interest, and uh, as well as the global economic interest. And, Congress ratified that, basically, when they ratified the agreement. Um, the whole progress on the industry side, uh, I think it's important to emphasize, it took 50 years. Uh, trade negotiations is very gradual. What happens coming out of the Doha round will be similarly very, very gradual. Um, it gives industry time to adjust. And, and which is awfully important. You know, I go, I go way back, as you can tell, but um, back in the Tokyo round, the chemical industry was very, very protectionist. And they saw what was happening in that. They changed their strategy to try to be globally competitive. And I think that they're vastly stronger today for having made that kind of a change. And I suspect that's probably very true on the, on the agricultural side. Um, one of the things that came out of the Uruguay round, in addition to the rules on agriculture, was the new dispute settlement mechanism, which the U.S. has used with a lot of effect on uh, Japanese uh, uh, phytosanitary standards on apples, the EU moratorium on biotech, and EU restrictions on uh, beef hormones. So it's, a, it's an important tool. At coming out of the Uruguay round, people viewed what happened on agriculture as just a first step. And as you all remember, it contained a requirement to restart the ag negotiations by 2000. When the Doha development round was finally launched in 2001, agriculture was the centerpiece. It was recognized that uh, that's the area where there were generally high barriers, and it was generally the area where develop, least developed countries could best compete. So from the beginning, it's been the centerpiece of the, of the Doha round. Other areas are important, you know, continued liberalization in, in industry and services. Um, nothing is going to happen on any of those other areas of importance unless there's an agreement on agriculture. So the whole process is pretty well held hostage to uh, what happens in agriculture. The Uruguay round rules, as you all know, press countries to move towards less trade distorting subsidies and uh, uh, pushed it in that direction. And the 1996 Farm Bill implemented that kind of an approach. 
Then in, in 2002, the U.S. kind of shifted directions with the farm bill that uh, brought in counter-cyclical payments and, and kind of uh, moved more towards uh, production and trade distorting subsidies. So in the Uruguay round, there was a peace clause that said that people wouldn't use the dispute settlement until 2003. But given the direction of the farm bill, of 2002 farm bill and the new dispute settlement mechanism, it was pretty inevitable that it, we were going to face cases. And as you all know, the, one of the big ones was the Brazil cotton case where the panel ruled against us and the final decision I think will be coming down on July 20th. Basically finding that our step two subsidies were illegal export subsidies, our export credit guarantee programs weren't consistent with WTO rules, and uh, direct payments program didn't qualify for the green box, uh, the WTO green box because of the planting restrictions on fruits and vegetables. So the U.S. eliminated the step two subsidies, uh, modified the export a credit guarantee program to the extent possible under current legislation and the administration is uh, basically proposing to do that in the 2007 farm bill which I think has so far is not being done. Then the, recently the Canadians are bringing a case arguing that we have exceeded our permissible uh, level of trade distorting subsidies based on the Brazil case that our direct payments don't qualify for green box which puts us over our allowed limits in, in some years. Well, some people argue we shouldn't worry about WTO dispute settlement cases, that they're expensive, a lot of countries may not bring them, they may be, we may put pressure on them for geopolitical reasons, etc. cetera. Um, I, I have to say I think that's a totally irresponsible position. Uh, first off, we're inviting other countries to do the same thing to us. And that's going to have a lot of ramifications for trade and industry as well as services and as well as for our export interests in agriculture. The other thing is I think it's stupid. Um, if you wait for a dispute settlement case, it means we suddenly have to change our policies um, without getting reciprocity that we'd get in a trade round. So I, I just think it's an irresponsible view, um, although I've heard it expressed. I think it's important to note that if we don't make the changes to comply uh, with, the, with the WTO dispute settlement, um, we're going to be subject to retaliation. And uh, I like your idea of extending the Farm Bill for two years, uh, but keep in mind that um, we're probably going to have retaliation against us in that period if we don't fix these things this summer. Um, let me just talk briefly about the implications of the Farm Bill um, for, the, for the Doha round. Uh, in looking at the Doha round, I think the, the U.S. has a huge potential benefit from the market access where uh, Chairman Crawford Falconer of the Agricultural Committee says, um, looks for a 60% to 85% cut in bound duties. And there, that would help the U.S., which basically has a comparative advantage in agriculture. So I think that would be a big boost. We have a huge potential benefit from the elimination of uh, export subsidies that's due to happen by 2013 since the EU accounts for about 80 percent of uh, export subsidies in the world. Um, domestic subsidies are complex. Uh, we can go into that more in the discussion if people feel like, but um, basically the reduction that uh, Crawford Falconer looks at would be likely would be U.S. trade distorting subsidies down to the low teens to 19 billion. EU and Japan making similar changes, which would require some changes by the U.S., but um, I would argue uh, definitely not something particularly earth shaking. For cotton, uh, it's agreed that developed countries give duty-free and quota-free access um, to least developed countries and reduce trade distorting subsidies um, more ambitiously and faster than for other products. So th there would definitely be some effects on cotton there. I think this kind of an outcome from the Doha round is uh, pretty clearly in the U.S. national economic interests. And so the question is, what provisions in the Farm Bill would advance the prospects for a Doha round? Um, possibility number one, which a number of people argue, is, well, let's just not worry about it. 
um, about, about cutting our domestic subsidies. Uh, if we don't cut them or even if we increase them, that just gives us another bargaining chip in the trade negotiations and we can use it as leverage. Um, the other possibility would be to extent politically feasible, we begin now to try to modify our production and trade distorting subsidies. And I have to admit, um, I come down e e extremely strongly on the latter uh, side that we should begin the process of cutting those subsidies right now as for, for all the other reasons that people have talked about, but also for the implications that that would have for a successful Doha round. Um, first off, our trade partners have been moving in that direction, most notably the EU, but Canada, New Zealand, and others. Um, I agree with Rob's comment very much that the 2002 Farm Bill moved U.S. negotiators into a defensive posture so they couldn't uh, really aggressively press for what we need to be pressing for in terms of better access. My past experience in trade negotiations has always been when the U.S. doesn't lead, absolutely nothing happens. And I think that's kind of the reason for why we're at a hiatus right now in the, in the Doha negotiations. Third, um, you, I would argue that it would be good to start this process now because it makes the adjustment process easier. Were we to go the other direction and ever have a successful international multilateral agreement, um, it, the adjustment would be much, much greater. So let me, let me just end with that and uh, look forward to the discussion. Before we go to the general discussion, I wanted to say a particular thank you to the Hewlett Foundation, who's provided a lot of support to the research that we're presenting today and also today's discussion. And of course, to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center as well. Well, we've got a lot of grist for a lot of mills, uh, so to speak. Uh, why don't we uh, open it up for questions and maybe I'll take the prerogative of the chair to uh, ask Bill Christ uh, a question. Bill, uh, you mentioned that we fell afoul of the WTO by not providing the option of planting fruits and vegetables. Has anyone suggested simply making that change? Well, the, it's, part of the, it's part of the USDA proposal. And um, the, the fruit, vegetable, and I guess wild rice people don't, don't like the idea because basically what you would be doing is um, having having subsidized, increased competition and basically subsidized competition in fruits and vegetables that right now don't receive subsidies. So they're very concerned about that. I thought the USDA proposal was, uh, was very well crafted um, in terms of along with proposing to get rid of the planting restrictions, it had uh, a lot of ideas on how to keep the fruits and vegetables guys whole. So, um, but uh, my impression is on the House Agricultural Committee, they're pretty well ignoring all of that. So that, that would uh, definitely put us at, counter, at retaliation here in not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Please, mm -hmm. and if you'll introduce yourself, Debbie. I'm Deborah Miller. I have a question for William Christ. Even if you got what you wanted in this year's trade bill, would that be enough to uh, restart Doha again? Doesn't the EU have to make significant reforms of the cap before there can really be much progress made in Doha? And I've heard that the EU really won't do that until 2013. Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I very much agree with you. you. It's inconceivable to have a successful Doha round without that from the EU and also without concessions from the Brazilians and the Indians and others on, on manufactured, uh, improving manufactured access. Um, so I, yeah, I, you could definitely not conclude the round. But I, I would argue that if the Congress were to uh, just in the, the, I think the direction is really important. If they were to move in the direction of reducing trade distorting and production distorting uh, subsidies, it would give our trading partners confidence that in a successful Doha round, we could actually get such an agreement through Congress. I, I think if we were to go the other direction and on the EU or India or Brazil or whoever, 
I'm going to be very skeptical of the ability of Susan Schwab to get a package through Congress when they've just gone the other direction. So I think that's really important. Um, so yeah, but you're absolutely right. You can't, you cannot conclude an, a round without better access to EU and also Brazil and India and others. May others of us? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> please. Um, uh, this is actually partly by way of a commercial. Um, Ford and I have a, a paper in that little packet on uh, the trade negotiation as well. And um, without disagreeing at all with uh, what Bill Christ is saying, one of the, uh, I think, essential points that we were trying to make is that we have forged a linkage in our collective minds here in the United States between cutting domestic subsidies on our farm programs and gaining market access measured in reduced trade barriers from others, the EU as well as uh, some developing countries. And we're suggesting that to some extent that may not be a helpful linkage. That it might be better to think about what really drives export growth for competitive sectors of U.S. agriculture, and that's demand expansion. And that we ought to evaluate the quality of the um, package on the table um, by its contribution to demand growth, particularly in, in developing countries with young populous, um, large populations. Um, <clears throat> and if you did that, and if you structured some of the um, you know, the, one of the issues that, that really didn't get covered in, in Bill's presentation is the whole issue of uh, sensitive and special products, where a lot of the trade interest probably lies in agriculture. And <clears throat> what, what we were trying to suggest is a way forward there uh, that would allow the, um, U.S. agricultural interest to participate in the growth of domestic consumption in, in those countries, and that a linkage like that might, again, also help to expand trade in a way that, that focusing excessively on reducing uh, market access barriers may not. So there's a lot to, um, to making this a more attractive picture. Or did you have a? No. The gentleman way in the back there, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you, uh, Andrew Petraka, the State University of New York. Um, there have been a lot of articles in newspapers recently about uh, blaming the Farm Bill for a great deal of uh, health problems in the United States because it corn subsidies lower the price of high fructose corn syrup, which is in basically everything that's bad for you. So I'd like to hear uh, your uh, ideas on that, on that issue. Or do you want to? Uh, well, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> um, An element of diversion, I guess. Well, no, I mean, I think that many members of the public have been persuaded especially by some sort of popular but, you know, interesting work by people like Michael Pollan and others, um, that the farm bill is the kind of source of the problem in relation to America's bad eating behavior, uh, which includes excessive consumption of sugars of all kinds uh, from a physiognomic point of view, notwithstanding what people have said sugar is sugar, uh, and it doesn't matter really if it's fructose or uh, glucose or uh, some other source. If you eat too much of it, it's not good for you. It may be true in a broad sense that the subsidies that have been paid to the commodity crops uh, have contributed to excessive production of those crops and consequently the price of those crops has been lower than it otherwise would have been. I think I basically agree with that. And then one has to sustain this, the elaborate syllogism by saying, therefore, people have used more corn to make more things than they otherwise would have. And therefore, we have more of those things that you can make with corn, including high fructose corn syrup. I, would, I guess I would prefer to sort of unpackage all of that and say that the reason 
actually, <laughs> that we produce high fructose corn syrup in such amounts has to do with our sugar subsidies uh, and our sugar program, which by supporting the price of sugar at levels uh, well above world market prices have made the market safe for high fructose corn syrup. So rather than attacking the corn subsidies as the source of the difficulty, if one is interested in, in uh, reducing the overall use of high fructose corn syrup for whatever reasons, you know, I, I guess I don't. Robin can comment on this. So they make a lot of. They used to make. He used to be involved with a company that makes a lot of high fructose corn syrup. Um, <laughs> uh, but no longer. No. So he can speak freely. But I, you know, I, I, it, it seems to me that if you're going to discipline the, uh, the the use of high fructose corn syrup, you would do so by uh, by eliminating or reducing the uh, the border protection for the U.S. sugar. We have a response from. I'm just a real quick one. I, I, I think this whole attempt to create good food and bad food um, is the wrong way of thinking about this issue. The obesity is a, a complex problem uh, that certainly is uh, contributed to by the abundant availability of low priced um, calories but it's also uh, contributed to by the change in our lifestyles that, that results in a lot less physical exercise. Um, <clears throat> it's growth of um, fast food industries, of, of lack of portion control. You know, I, the list goes on and on and on. And to sit there and say that if we simply fix our commodity policies in the United States, obesity is going to go away is not a useful contribution to the public discussion. Gentlemen, yeah. let me make, let me uh, be unuseful and say I think that's please introduce yourself. I'm Tom you. Marchione. I'm an independent consultant. Was with AID for a while, and um, I have to um, disagree pretty profoundly with your last comment. Uh, I think that's where we begin. We begin by making this not only an agriculture policy, but an agriculture, nutrition, and health policy. And uh, we do that by thinking in terms of where our subsidies would do best in terms of reducing the cost of foods that are good for us. Um, I just happen to have Miriam Virrell's article here from the New York Times where she suggests that the cost of uh, sweet drinks has uh, decreased by 25 percent over a period of the last couple decades, whereas the cost of fruits and vegetables have gone up 40 percent. And, you know, I think that might be related to where we put our subsidies. But I'd like to um, make, just raise another subject having to do with international food aid. And I, I, I appreciated very much uh, uh, Rob Johnson's comments about increasing consumption in the, in the developing world. And how do, we, how do we go about doing that? And it seems to me that our, the way we do that might start with our, our international PL480 program and the way we pursue that. And, uh, you know, and one of the proposals that was floating while I was in my last few years at AID was to use more of the appropriations for PL 480 to actually allow local purchase, which increases, uh, you know, the, um, the income of farmers who produce foods that are needed in, in the countries where we distribute food aid or nearby countries. And uh, the other thing would be to allow some value added to be um, supported through our PL480 program, whereas now we, we retain all that value added in, in our products that we export to, uh, to those countries. And that is a big source of employment and income generation in those countries, is to not allow the value added part of food aid to become, you know, a part of the assistance program. Because, I mean, after all, a lot of these countries that are, that are most uh, in need of improved food consumption are um, our food producing com countries and and the uh, the job creation part of their economies could be around their uh, their agricultural industries I can, why don't you come I can make a couple quick comments but um, Robin Ford probably can give a lot more but um, one one thing on the question of how do you increase uh, their ability to, to eat better and consume more. I mean, I, I would argue the Doha round really is critical for that. I mean, it's important for that. I shouldn't say critical. Um, 
the whole idea of it is that it raises uh, income and wealth around the world, and particularly in the least developing countries, that increased wealth is going to go into food, diet, improved diet probably first off, which could really help U.S. farmers a lot um, if we have it, if we're basically export oriented. Um, on, the, on the cash for food aid, I, I believe the administration proposed something like 25 percent of that would be cash, and I also believe that's gone nowhere on the Hill. Um, and of course, as you know, in the negotiations, the EU is um, pushing for cash only, which also will go nowhere in the nego – it won't be agreed to in the negotiations. So, um, but, it's, but from a point of view of the developing countries, it's probably a great idea. Um, just – I'll comment very briefly. I, first of all, I, I think – I hope you understand that at least today we, we have a very broad agenda which nonetheless has been focused with respect to agricultural policy primarily on Title I of the agricultural legislation, the commodity programs. That doesn't mean that we are, aren't interested or haven't been experienced in uh, thinking about the issues surrounding PL 480, which are profound. I'll just make one comment. PL 480 really originated, I believe the Food for Peace provisions uh, originated in 1954. But uh, the, the program was, I think, clearly conceived of as a vent for surplus. Now, if we don't have surpluses uh, and are not likely to in the foreseeable future of the sort that we've had, then you really need to begin to completely rethink uh, that program. Secondly, my late colleague Willis Peterson pr proposed some 15 years ago a strikingly simple but I think ingenious proposal for global food stamps, uh, which is a, a, a form of the argument uh, in favor of cash assistance, uh, although of course it's fiat cash, um, which I think was very well reasoned at the time and bears uh, uh, revisiting. Interesting. I'm going to go to the gentleman here and then Charlotte and then the Professor Samuels over here. Yes, I'm Jim Gruff, Decision Leaders. Um, I was a U.S. agriculture negotiator and spent much of my career trying to communicate with U.S. farmers about trade policy issues. And um, I wanted to just see if Ford and, and Rob might have some comments about that kind of communication. I think the, um, it, it's critical to have the ideas first. And I think I haven't read your paper yet, but from Rob's description, it sounds like it's a really good set of ideas. But the communication with the rank and file with of U.S. agriculture obviously is, is, is going to have to be done. To me, the most compelling example is the World Trade Organization and its status or lack of status with U.S. agriculture. I think for many years there's been a very compelling argument that a thriving, effective WTO is absolutely critical for, for U.S. agriculture. But if you look at where we are with the 2000, 2007 Farm Bill, the way most of U.S. agriculture has behaved, uh, in this process and, and the views of the House Agriculture Committee, you would not get that impression at all. In fact, you would get the opposite impression that the WTO is of very little value, has very little value for U.S. agriculture. So um, I, I like the ideas as Rob has described them. Uh, Rob and I were in a group sponsored by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs where we talked about some similar ideas. But to me, I think it doesn't matter whether it's now or it's two years from now. The passage of two years isn't necessarily going to make a difference. How do you communicate with U.S. farmers that this is in their interest? Not only the WTO part, but the very, the very sound reasons that Rob touched on. This is in our interest because we have to be more globally competitive. There are a lot of other reasons why we have to do this. But as far as I can tell, the message has not gotten through at all. Well, I've, I've Jim, I think that's a very helpful comment. And, um, as I've sat here and thought more about Mary's suggestion, uh, the more I think about it, the more I like it as a step in that direction. Um, we, uh, there are a few isolated people, like the Bob Thompsons of the world, who try to explain complex institutions like WTO to farmers and, and to raise these issues, but they're, they're too one-off and, and anecdotal. We clearly need um, first to have a more coherent thought through policy approach and then a much better organized um, um, communications approach. And I confess that I passed that off by simply saying we had to use the two-year period wisely without much in the way of program prescriptions, but I take your point. Very quickly, I'd like to say just that the there, there is in the ethanol enthusiasm a kind of nativism uh, and 
a sort of uh, xenophobia uh, that reinforces uh, the sense that the WTO is not the solution to our problems. In fact, in the last forum of, the, of this kind that we had here, someone actually explicitly raised the point, which Senator Daschle does in his comment on our article to appear in the next issue of Foreign Affairs, that, you know, in effect, why do we need uh, trade liberalization when we have ethanol? Um, it'll raise prices, and isn't that what we wanted? Didn't we want higher prices for poor farmers? Uh, problem is, of course, that most poor farmers are net consumers, uh, not uh, net producers. Uh, so when S Senator Daschle argues, as he does in his comment, that food deficit nations uh, a lot is improved by increasing commodities prices, uh, unfortunately, he just uh, has it uh, de almost definitionally wrong. Charlotte, and then Mike. Yeah, I think my comment follows nicely on that. I was just going to say a couple of you talked about the U.S. not being offensive enough or e able to be offensive enough on market access, and I, maybe one can turn that around. They really haven't been pushed enough to be offensive on market access because perhaps, and Rob made the point that maybe the commodity programs are no longer meeting the needs of today's agriculture in the U.S., uh, in fact, perhaps one can say that the commodity producers have so grown accustomed to subsidies that, and also Brazil has become much more competitive, that market access is no longer really as interesting, and then you throw ethanol on top of that. Um, so I would argue it's not just a question of U.S. negotiators not being offensive enough. They're maybe not being pushed <laughs> by, uh, by agricultural producers to, to focus on market access. Um, and then maybe just a, a question um, on, on the biofuels. I'm always amazed by how very brilliant and respected people can take very different perspectives on this issue. I mean, there is very alarmist language on food versus fuel and food prices. And then you have people on the other side that say, well, this is just a temporary thing. Production will increase. Uh, uh, we're really not looking at a major crisis here. So I'm wondering how how we can have such divergent views among, again, very well-respected uh, scholars in, in the community. And then just maybe on, on Ford's point on cellulosic, I wonder if the, the corn uh, farmers aren't going to insist that the first cellulosic will be corn stover rather than switchgrass. <laughs> um, and then I wonder if anybody would like to comment on the case that I believe Brazil has now also brought. They're not only a third party to the uh, Canadian case uh, against the U.S. on corn, but I believe they've launched their own case. So any, any comments on that? I'll start with Bill on the pushing no, Farmers oh, pushing the farmers, and then Ford. I think you've got some. Well, no, I, no, I, I, I think your your point on the farm community um, being less export oriented now than they used to be, and and maybe a little bit more addicted to subsidies is is very correct. I don't. I mean, I, do, I don't see them, at, at, and I think it's going to be a real test here in the farm bill is to to see where they're where they're really coming from. Unfortunately, I, I think on the industry side, you see less, less pressure for a multilateral negotiation also. The industry is all focused on, uh, on the bilateral free trade agreements. And, um, you know, the, I think the best chance for really dealing with U.S. agricultural policies and multilateral negotiation, the, the bilateral agreements basically leave agriculture alone just because of the, uh, of the subsidy problem can only be addressed multilaterally. So. I think you're absolutely right, and if Congress goes ahead now and increases production and trade distorting subsidies, um, we're just going to make the farm community more addicted to subsidies. Well, uh, this isn't really intended to be facetious, but uh, apropos of your brilliant and respected comment, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you're including me in that group or not, but um, uh, regardless of whether people are brilliant and respected, some of them will be right and some will be wrong. Uh, and uh, I would uh, uh, hope, uh, in some ways, to be wrong uh, about some of the things I've said today. Uh, I, I think that uh, some of the dislocations and disruptions that I see coming uh, in this area uh, may be mediated by supply response. But again, uh, this year we've had the most dramatic supply response in corn production probably in our, in our history. And yet, after a, a bounce back to about 325, we're back up at 352, and the long-term futures are well above $4. So, you know, uh, I, maybe I'll be wrong, in which case, as Keynes said, I'll change my opinion. Uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, I think that uh, there's reason for concern. Mike. 
I'm, I'm Michael Samuels from Samuels International Associates. Um, I, I'd like to come at this from a slightly different angle, but maybe end up in the same place everyone else seems to be. That is, there was a time when we thought that the um, Farm Bill would be affected by the progress in the Doha negotiations. And uh, in fact, there were signs that some on the Hill were willing to kind of leave the agenda open to see what evolved in the Doha negotiations. And since nothing seems to have evolved, uh, the field was left open for those in the ag committees to play their own game. But I would argue that there's a reasonable possibility that Doha will go nowhere, that the WTO has gone as far as it can go, that uh, there's little hope that uh, liberalization and reciprocal uh, market access will any longer be part of the game through the WTO. And it isn't that I come at this with happiness or from lack of experience. But I would say that's at least a 50-50 possibility, and I would argue it's even more than that. What then do we do? And here's where Rob's suggestion makes an awful lot of sense. That is, we try to come up with some way to have a different farm policy. Uh, we don't let it be a farm policy brought upon, about by trade negotiations that many in the farm community and most in the farm interests on the Hill think is irrelevant anyhow or intrusive if not irrelevant. Uh, and so then you come down to the possibility, how do you do it? Uh, as much as I love academics, they alone aren't enough. Uh, if you devise a commission, there are two ways of coming up with a commission. You can get a commission that is congressionally determined, perhaps, and working it with the executive branch, in which case you have a heavy political load on it, in which case some of the very people who don't want to see any changes in the farm uh, programs are likely to have prominent places on your commission. Therefore, I would argue that it's a mistake to think that you can accomplish anything with a congressionally mandated or even executive branch mandated commission whose purpose is to come up with some suggestions that hopefully would be loosed on the country in December of 2008, which is probably a good time, or January of 2009. How do you do it? Well, you find some rich foundations that are prepared to put forward the money to create some commission that must have high-profile people, some of whom have, um, like Hamilton and Baker, uh, uh, high you know, credibility throughout the country, but who aren't tied into the, uh, the Dashiell Dole approach to farm legislation, and have those high-profile people sign their name to this and have it be their report that would hopefully develop a new direction of thinking that may even get some credibility uh, amongst the farm community and eventually might even be relevant to trying to pull the WTO out of its mess. Well, I, I find that very persuasive. <laughs> um, and uh, let, let, me, let me just say that I think that to some extent inside the Beltway there was always an overemphasis on the degree to which the Doha round would or would not constrain or affect the course of domestic farm legislation. Uh, most of the key players, people like Colin Peterson, really don't, you know, give a rat's ass about what the WTO <laughs> is going to do or will do. Um, because, you know, it doesn't have much to do with that congressional district up there in northwest Minnesota. Maybe it does in a broad sense, you know, but uh, that broad sense is awfully hard to communicate. Um, what you were proposing is a kind of no regrets policy in which we pursue domestic agricultural legislative reform in Title I and if the consequence of that reform is to, uh, is to encourage or enliven uh, trade liberalization and negotiations, so be it. And if it isn't, we're still ahead of the game. I was, um, Mike, thank you very much for, I think, um, building on Mary's suggestion in a very useful way and making the, the distinction that I was trying to make between a, a politicized commission that represents constituencies uh, 
and a, an objective one that is um, uh, trying to use the evidence to develop sound policy change. Um, you know, the the other point that I think is important to put into that and that I, I maybe didn't emphasize as well as I would have liked to in my presentation is that um, reform is not just about taking away the commodity title and other things in the existing uh, and and letting farmers go cold turkey or, or whatever you want to call it. It really is about getting a modern 21st century understanding of the realities of the rural economy and commercial agriculture and, and all of that and designing policies that fit that need. And to do that with one important constraint that I think was implicit in your linking it to the WTO and that is to, that those policies should no longer be trade distorting. Um, and we've tried to propose policies that we think are non-trade distorting, um, uh, but they're certainly not the only non-trade distorting instruments that could be used. And so I think your suggestion and with the, with the caveat that the assignment has to be to, to do this with the United States bearing the full cost of uh, that farm policy and not shifting those costs onto others through the trade system would, would be an important part of the, the prescription. Well, let me follow up on uh, the second time you really, at least to my ear, advocated a growth strategy for rural America. You looked at three sets of farmers. One set that is really uh, large scale, quite possibly long term competitive with regard to the commodities with the problem as you identified of handling the inevitable risks of weather and so forth. But you talked then about two other groups of farmers, the maybe 300,000 kind of in-between farmers who depend on agriculture, but it doesn't yield them much of a living. And I think you had a 1.5 million group who uh, are involved in farming, uh, maybe that their uh, family was involved in farming, they've kept the farm, but that's not the principle. My good friend focus. Ford Runge here is a farmer. <laughs> well, I, I went to high school in a uh, farming community, a community that served the farmers. And uh, even back uh, at that time, you could see people being pushed off the land or pushed into, I'm driving the school bus, but I've kept the farm. In terms of that strategy for rural development, and you talked about infrastructure, this could be broadband, accelerating the distribution of broadband access as well as the more traditional forms. Do you see any thinking along that line? Is there someone that is saying, let's step back and have a rural growth strategy? Um. Yes, there are. I mean, there are a number of people. Stan Johnson, at uh, Iowa, retired from Iowa State University, I think, has done a lot of thinking about these issues. I wasn't and thinking so much of the academic community, but of the, well, the Hill or administration. I'm you're I'm getting there. I'm, I'm sorry. starting there. I'm not going to get to the Hill and, and the administration, but you're going to get to some organizations. Um, RUPRI, the, what is the initial? I don't Rural know what the acronym is. Research Institute. Yeah. Yes, um, that uh, uh, has a number of people uh, coming together around this issue. There's a group um, that's looking at this issue, uh, particularly with respect to southern issues, um, which are somewhat different than, than Midwestern issues. Um, what I, one of the things that it seems to me that it's important to uh, recognize, and it kind of got buried in the statistics I gave about farmers, is that the rural poverty problem, the rural income problem, is not concentrated in farming. It's by and large in the non-farm rural economy. And this notion that we are going to use farm policy to lift that part of rural America out of low incomes and poverty is, is just misguided. And, and we've got to get away from that and understand much better what the real causes of um, low incomes in rural America are, and they have a great deal to do with distance from markets and the costs are there, the lack of communications facilities, the, the lack of uh, uh, re, uh, amenities that would uh, attract or retain talent in those communities, uh, lack of entrepreneurial options, um, the bypassing of commercial banks uh, on main streets by uh, by international or by national and, and 
public financial institutions? There, I mean, it, it's, it has very little to do with commodity policy is kind of what I'm trying to suggest and a lot to do about with other things. I, I would speak uh, uh, further to Mr. Samuel's point. Uh, you know, he, he made the case that the WTO negotiations, the Doha round, doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Maybe it's gone as far as it could, given the current external constraints. Uh, in the, the event that the United States actually would adopt the type of farm policy that you're talking about, the uh, negotiating leverage that the country would have in the, do in the Doha round might be uh, changed quite a bit, in enhanced quite a bit. In that event, should we wish to re-engage the Doha negotiations, or ought we to seek a new negotiating mandate and, 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 a, and a, a, a new round with a different name and perhaps clearer objectives, less muddled by development, whatever that means? <laughs> I'll give a quick response while others think about it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you need a new round or a, or a new acronym or, or a new title, but it's clear that this negotiation has backed us into a little bit of a blind alley with more exceptions than there are opportunities for trade reform. And you do have to find a way to, to back out of some of that, um, whether that requires a, a new round or not, or, or simply a major repositioning of the discussion, I don't know. Well, oh, again, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I. Um, Unfortunately, I agree with Mike's pessimistic assessment of, a, of maybe a 50-50 chance that it, it doesn't succeed. But um, I, I would argue against a different mandate. And in fact, I think the negotiators have made a, a huge amount of progress. I think it would be a, a real tragedy to let that progress just slip away. Uh, there's, they're too close. Um, you know, the Uruguay round took eight years. Um, people and negotiators, they always start talking about how a round's going to be completed in two or three years. That's a lot of stuff. It's not, it doesn't happen. This is, a, this is a more complicated negotiation with more countries involved than has ever happened before. And to go back to start all over would be a huge shame. And I think it would be a terrible tragedy if we can't have future multilateral negotiations because there's so many issues that can't be addressed in any other way. And um, I think that um, there were a lot of reasons right after World War II why the U.S. turned to a multilateral trade system. A lot of uh, very, very important political reasons and foreign policy reasons. And I just think it would be a tragedy to lose all of that. And, uh, but but they, these rounds are always oversold. This has always been oversold in terms of what it was going to do for developing countries and what it was going to do for agriculture and everything. And that's an inevitable part of the process. I'm not arguing against it. It's just inevitable. But I, I think it would be a mistake to go back to a, to try to do a new mandate and everything else. This was too hard to get going as it was. Well, yeah, I actually, well, I appreciate your question uh, because it it's, was provocative. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it raises, uh, well, I have two quick reactions. The first is I don't quite know how one would decorously bury uh, the Doha round. Um, uh, it might be happening even while we uh, Well, I think <laughs> it's, the corpse might be rotting, but, but, not, uh, decorously. Uh, but not decorously. The, the, the I, I think that what what one might be able to do is to exploit the turn uh, in the election, uh, essentially to say it's time to refresh uh, our commitments uh, to the Doha round. Uh, but I would have to say to you, and you won't be surprised to hear me say this, that I don't think there was anything at all conceptually wrong with the idea of attempting to make good on some of our commitments in the Uruguay round to the developing countries in the Doha round. Uh, and uh, if we expect in any way to perpetuate a process of multilateralism uh, in uh, trade negotiating, we have got to come to terms as a government and a country with the real role that countries like Brazil and India are going to play in the international trading system going forward. Um, and I detected to some extent in your remark uh, a sentiment uh, in favor of sort of withdrawing from that process and uh, perhaps returning the uh, WTO GATT system to a kind of a rich man's club, which I just don't think is feasible nor uh, consistent with the long-term trade interests of the U.S. Now, maybe I'm over-interpreting what you yeah. said. I, I did not intend to imply that. It's just that if the United States really gets its act together on agricultural policy, can we achieve the best outcome in a multilateral trade negotiation by trying to pick up the pieces of Doha with all the baggage that's there and march forward with that? 
or should we, we, we might then be in a position to say, hey, let's get a clean sheet of paper, let's try starting over, because we, we learned a whole bunch of things that don't work very well in Doha. I, I, <laughs> still, I still think it's a provocative and good question. Let me just uh, add a point or two, and I was careful to make sure that my glass was more than half full <laughs> before <laughs> making the response that I uh, wanted to pick up on the, the whole idea of the development round. There was an awful lot of disappointment among a large number of countries as the result of the Uruguay round. They felt there were serious obligations that in, in some extreme cases would take a good part of the national budget to fulfill, let alone the current focus on trade policy in those individual countries. And remember the, uh, the WTO, unlike the bank or the fund, is a one country, one vote organization. Second, in terms of the timing, if you sort of looked at the sequence of trade negotiations, each one has taken two or three years longer. So in many ways, we're, if you looked at oh, Tokyo and then Uruguay, we're really right on target. And I, I <laughs> just to, to pick up, I know this is maybe shouldn't be quite as full as it is. <laughs> yeah, but barely. And to, <laughs> and to pick up on, on Ford's comment about, uh, I gather, looking ahead, say, to 2009, I think that whoever... Uh, is president will have a renewed emphasis on multilateralism and I think there's been a broad popular response to what has been perhaps perceived as an overemphasis on uh, unilateral action on the part of the United States so I think they're, they're uh, in fact and in fact in some cases trade capacity building trade facilitation uh, areas in the uh, non-agricultural area I think there's a lot of progress that in fact has been made to, to second what Bill said. So I wouldn't just make a small pitch for not giving up on Doha quite yet. Camp, that's absolutely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mike and I have disagreed on a variety of You know, <laughs> the Democrats on the Hill are saying we, we insist on labor and environment in trade, legis in trade negotiations. That's unilateral. That's not multilateral. Because we know that in the multilateral system, the WTO, most other countries don't want labor and environment included. In fact, they'll argue that they're damnedest to keep them out. So, I mean, you don't, I don't think you can make the assumption that whoever is going to come in next time is going to have a commitment to multilateralism, particularly if you have a WTO system that has proven itself to be as imperfect as it is. Furthermore, uh, I don't buy the argument that the Uruguay round screwed up the possibility for developing countries. If it did, why did so many developing countries choose to join the WTO subsequent to the Uruguay round? Well, that's, that's a complicated question to which I have a complicated answer that I'll, we'll talk about afterwards. And I, uh, I think the uh, stepping back and looking at the question of environment and labor rights, that if you look at the 20th century, there was an enormous effort to get the relationship between labor and markets at a more acceptable level. In the second half of the 20th century, at least in this country and in many other parts, there was an attempt to do the same thing with regard to the externalities involved in the environment. And in many ways, this movement is now taking on a global character. So I would look at what the Democrats are doing as really part of that movement and not uh, strictly as something that's narrowly focused only on the trade regime. But we can disagree about that, uh, <laughs> that later. Uh, do we have, we have time for a, uh, a few more questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I beg your pardon, sir. If you'll, again, remind us. Uh, Bruce White with uh, Catholic Relief Services. Um, as we look at the, as you all look in the past in terms of the agricultural policies in the United States and how well they have worked and how well they have not worked to really get us, I guess, past the depression, I wonder if there's uh, in that all those lessons, some lessons for the uh, development for other countries to look at how they can best develop. Because when, when I hear people talk about trade a lot, what it, it seems like you know, we're talking about ratcheting down our domestic support programs, but we're really asking other countries to really embrace more of a kind of a laissez-faire agricultural system. So is that the right recipe for countries to really to, to develop? Because if we look around the world and all the developed countries, is that, was that the recipe that they used? And I don't think it was. 
And so if that doesn't work for any of the developed countries, why would that work for developing countries? Well, let me start again. Um, there's a generalization to which there are a lot of exceptions, but the generalization runs something like this. If you're a poor country, you tend to tax your agriculture to finance industrialization. If you're a developing country, you uh, tend to be fairly close to market-driven forces because of the balance of politics and, and the stage of economic development. And if you're a developed country, you tend to support your agriculture because you can afford to and or they've usually gotten pretty well organized politically. So I don't think it's fair to say f to sit where we sit today and look back over the 70 years and say our development from an agricultural co country to an industrial country was driven by agricultural protection. It wasn't. Uh, for most of that period, in fact, I think uh, we probably were fairly market oriented with a little border protection thrown in, a, in some areas. But to me, uh, the big disappointment that I have had with sort of how Doha has developed and how the United States and the European Union have managed the agricultural part of the negotiation is that there is a once in a generation opportunity, it seems to me, for a lot of developing countries to move from taxing agriculture to a market-oriented agriculture without having to go through the subsidizing agricultural phase that we did and then the very painful process of ratcheting those subsidies down. And if we let the Chinas and Indias go on much longer, they are going to be rich enough to afford very ample protection of their agricultural systems and it will be a long, long time, maybe um, never, when we can actually get some of those barriers erased. But I, I'm just going to make a quick comment that um, I, I don't know that I think the, the Uruguay round rules are um, laissez-faire. I mean, you know, Annex 2 has a, a very solid list of uh, policies that governments can do that are non-trade and production distorting. And um, I, th I think uh, you, the, you picking from those, you can design uh, policies that um, really allow more promotion of development and things. So, um, I would just add to that that uh, although there are people that would say agriculture was America's most successful industrial policy, that really if you look at it in terms of the contributions of education and innovation, I think you those see those as major drivers of the success. Of course, we had the right soil and climate, but that in terms of policy, those were major drivers of U.S. Uh, agricultural success. I, I just make the quick remark that in many respects, I would be very cautious about drawing any lessons uh, from U.S. agricultural policy history for developing countries, apart from the point that was just made regarding invest, investing in human capital uh, and technological development. Because in the course I teach undergraduates, you know, I point out to them that the voyages of discovery, uh, the, the discovery of the continent of North America effectively increased the quantity of potentially of, uh, arable land for every uh, member of the population living on the European continent sixfold. That was probably a unique event. Now, it didn't manifest itself until the late 19th century. But by the late 19th or 20th century, uh, the combination of technological progress together with the vast uh, arable uh, land areas in this country had created a problem that was rather unique in the history of mankind of chronic surplus production. Uh, and uh, the response of the emergency legislation of 1933 was essentially to respond, probably in the long run uh, in, in a, a misconceived way, to the problem of surplus production by mandating uh, a quid pro quo that if you want the subsidy, you've got to restrain your output. That was a uniquely American problem. And it certainly doesn't uh, uh, characterize a situation of a developing country in which population pressure is pushing against food resources today. So I'd be very cautious about you know, making those types of comparisons. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Yes, I, uh, well, my name is Sergio Soto. And I've been working for the 
uh, Minister of Economy of Mexico for some years now, and I would like to uh, contribute uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this comment to this discussion. Uh, the question of how developing countries should take or not uh, the U.S. agricultural policy as a model uh, well, perhaps some 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 traits of the of the U.S. policy would would work, but uh, certainly I, I think that, that that is not the case. Uh, developing countries uh, uh, negotiated the Uruguay round, of course. They participated and they had to sign it because it was a single undertaking. I don't think everybody was every every country was uh, very happy with the outcome, but uh, at the very end, it was a single undertaking, and you take it or leave it. And if you don't take it, you will not participate in the future of uh, the agricultural policy and the future of trade and agriculture and so on. So at this point in time, there is a set of rules, a uh, set of rules that are good for some, uh, worse for others, but anyhow, uh, the rules are there. Uh, now, uh, take, a, take a look. Uh, U.S. policy, U.S. Agriculture, agricultural policy is based on subsidies, and subsidies mean budget, and I don't know if in the developing countries we have the, the, the budget to compete with, uh, uh, with U.S. Uh, uh, budget. So uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, that, that, that we can take uh, all what is in the U.S. policy to, to apply uh, uh, to developing countries' agriculture. Nonetheless, uh, in Mexico, we, we have uh, taken some uh, programs that are applied in the United States, and we have applied to Mexico also. But again, the level of subsidies in the United States are much more higher, and I'm uh, I'm not going to take it, uh, to go into specifics, but uh, certainly uh, uh, is uh, uh, in the in the overall it's completely different. And the other thing that uh, perhaps is completely different is, as you mentioned, the land, uh, the type of land, the type of uh, climate. The type of, uh, if you say, if you can, if you, you wish the, 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 the rain you have, then it's completely different than, than in many developed countries have. Uh, other, other, perhaps other difference, and I just take one minute, is that uh, in developed countries could divide it perhaps in two main groups. One, one group that can produce uh, agricultural goods, other group that cannot produce any agricultural good. So for the, the countries that do not produce any, any agriculture, they, 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 the rising prices is, is, uh, is a killing, not for the others. So, well, that, that was all my comment. And, and perhaps if I go back to the question of biofuels, uh, we have this uh, uh, um, ethanol and we have corn, but in the middle of them, we have the HFC, HF, uh, uh, high, high fructose corn syrup. I don't know if you, if you could uh, uh, make a comment on that, how, what is the perspective, what, uh, what is the production, if that would uh, uh, help us in the future, if the production it would be just uh, finished, or what would be the, the future of this industry? Thank you. Well, Robin's thinking about high fructose corn syrup, which I can tell you. <laughs> I was trying not to. Um, um, just uh, apropos of the previous comment, and, uh, as you p point out, Mexico uh, is far less well endowed uh, with uh, arable uh, acres and soils than uh, North America, uh, besides Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. But it's very telling that the number of acres under cultivation in the United States uh, has not changed appreciably since 1920. It's remained a, a more or less at an equilibrium around 400 million acres of arable land. And that should tell you something. It should tell you that the reason that's so is because it isn't worth it to try to farm the acres outside of that range. <clears throat> what it's been worth doing is increasing the yields on those acres. And that's what we have done. But when people begin to say that in response to the pressures created by the biofuels revolution that we're going to expand acreage, think again. Because we have settled at this equilibrium for a reason. If we expand acreage to 420 or 430 million in this country, we will be farming land that is much less productive, uh, much more subject to drought, uh, and much more uh, subject to environmental damage. Uh, than the land we have now. And God knows we have enough problems with those issues already. So uh, the extensive margin, as uh, agricultural economists call it, uh, 
is not, in my view, a terribly promising uh, route to take in relation to the pressures created by the current uh, shortages. Ford, as part of this diversion uh, <coughs> from uh, corn for feed and food to uh, energy, is that endangering markets that we've established around the world? Are we likely to lose those markets over time? Quickly. The United States has an enormous comparative advantage in the production of number two yellow corn. We do not have a comparative advantage in the production of ethanol. Hence, if we substitute corn that has been going into the export markets, and this, by the way, has only begun to really take hold, uh, in, and divert that corn for ethanol use, we are manifestly pursuing policies that are not reflective of our comparative advantage. Well, if I, do you have that, another question? That, that, yes, no, that's, that's uh, responsive. The thought of the, the response I was hoping to elicit. <laughs> I, I don't want to wear out my welcome, but I, I do have. <laughs> well, you are the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a long Ro one. Rob, you raised the, the two points uh, uh, that uh, were very clear and, and potentially actionable, uh, um, getting rid of the 49 Act and uh, a two-year extension of current legislation, nothing longer. Have you had any discussions with the White House to see whether there might be some interest there in actually uh, uh, associating with those views? Because, uh, you know, that some kind of backstop may be needed for the Congress in order to, uh, to achieve that type of outcome. I agree with your observation, but no, we've had no discussions. Um, not because it wouldn't be a good idea, um, but because we just really put all this together in the last couple of weeks and, and we're sort of, um, you, you have the good fortune or misfortune of being sort of the f first publics exposed to these ideas and we're still trying to um, massage it a little bit to uh, understand what works and what doesn't. But since you asked a question, I felt I didn't answer very well or didn't explain very well back on the biofuels issue why we think the counter-cyclical subsidy, as we call it, um, make sense rather than looking like a Texas hedge and, <coughs> and doubling the incentives. And I think one way of thinking about it is um, imagine you're an investor in the, in the biofuels industry and um, what you know today is that I get a 51 cent a gallon or $1.40 plus per bushel subsidy regardless of what the price of corn is and regardless of what the price of oil is. And so you can make a calculation that corn prices have to get extremely high before you can't cover your variable costs and quite high before you can't earn a return on capital. And so there's a huge incentive to expand the industry very rapidly, very dramatically. We made a judgment that you can't go from there to no subsidies and you've got to figure out how you're going to make money competing um, on a level playing field. But there is a middle point that says, and, I, and we've ducked the question of where this subsidy flex point, that's your flex point. My flex point is actually lower than that because um, but what we want people to do is to look at it and say, I no longer have a guaranteed return <coughs> if corn prices get above this flex point. Uh, I, then I then have to compete in the market to earn a return on my capital. And that changes the incentives to build more capacity, I think, very significantly. It doesn't destroy it. I mean, there will be efficient producers who will look at that and say, I'm willing to take my chances. But what we are trying to do is to slow down the rush of capital into this industry, not just for the food versus fuel and fuel versus environment reasons, but for the good uh, stability of the industry itself. Prevent it from overshooting. Yeah. We're not trying to stop the train. We're trying to slow it down. Here, David and then the gentleman back there will make these the last two questions. I'm David Klaus. I'm, an, uh, I guess at this point, an independent consultant um, working with a couple different groups. 
Um, just a comment on the energy policy, on the energy issue and, and, and the counter-cyclical. It seems, and I'd be interested in, in, you know, I can understand why you would want to tie it to one, you know, I, you've given a good logic as to why you want to, to have a subsidy that operates that for the purposes of the farm issues and the agricultural community, agriculture issues. I, it's hard for me to understand how it works in the world where oil fluctuates between, you know, what, you know, what has it been in the last 30 years, somewhere between 15 and, you know, $70 a barrel, and it still may just be an irrelevant policy if, if the energy policy is such that it, it makes um, ethanol, you know, no matter what you do, if, it, if, if the price of oil is so high. I mean, I think that's sort of the experience in Brazil. Everyone's got these flex fuel cars, and they go back and forth, you know, at the pump based on which, you know, you, you can make the real economic choice. Um, that's sort of one question, but that's not actually not really what I wanted uh, to ask you. And, and what, what seems to me is I, I worked for a long time for a member of Congress who, when asked once whether he thought Congress works, gave a, a, a long answer, but the nut, of, the nut of his answer was, I think Congress does an excellent job of figuring out when there's a problem that needs to be addressed and a reasonably fair solution on the table. And as I've listened to this discussion, what I sort of hear is that there's about five different entities that see about five different problems. And you have mm -hmm. Commodity farmers who see the problem as being how do we hold off people who want to take away our subsidies? You have people who want to talk about rural growth and development, and you've said that right now farm policy is pretty irrelevant, not irrelevant, but certainly not what I would do if I were trying to drive, you know, farm policy. Uh, rural, rural health and, you know, the economies there. You've got people who care about energy and saying, what, what are we going to do about biofuels and all this stuff? And they think the problem is, is that. Then you've got trade policy people who are sitting there tra trying to figure out how are we going to keep Doha together and not destroy all this, you know, the progress and the momentum we've made towards a, you know, a, an integrated world market where if we can get growth and, you know, and that's been fairly successful. And then you've got people who care about sustainable development and how does all those agricultural issues. And it, it, what sort of seems to me is, you know, I'll go back to the other side of his answer, which is, you know, Congress is a very good institution for dealing with a problem that seems to need to be addressed and there's a reasonably fair solution on the table. I kind of get the sense there's no real, you know, we're not even at the point where this process has figured out that there's a problem that needs to be addressed, or at least a problem that everyone is trying to solve. And you've got so many people trying to solve so many different problems that the idea that there'd be a reasonably fair solution or some combination of things like that on the table just seems just wildly remote. Am I, am I sort of missing something here, or what's your take on that analysis of the situation? <laughs> well, I was with you. I was with you all the way up to your conclusion, um, and I mean, it, to some extent, I think what we were, what I was trying to say, what Ford and I were trying to say, what, that I presented, maybe didn't present very well on the farm policy, is something close to what you're saying. That you, we have a collection of interests who have pieces of this, um, in which they have a very strong interest and most of those pieces require pulling resources away from where the resources currently are, which is in the commodity title. And I've had a, a somewhat different saying about how Congress works, and that is that you can't beat something with nothing. Um, and that's the notion that uh, we cannot change the commodity title in order to free up resources to do all of these other things unless we can solve the problem that the commodity title was originally designed to address, which is that there is risk in agriculture and that as an unintended consequence of other policies, there's also sometimes income issues um, in agriculture. I think the income issues have by and large gone away. I think we are in resource balance in agriculture and I, the, I, I try to point to some of the evidence that, that would reinforce that. But the problem that exist for which a fair solution has not been yet put on the table is what should replace the commodity title. And we've got to answer that before we can answer all of those other questions that you laid out. Just analytically, the problem here does tend to separate itself out into different components and different interests. There's no question of that. Um, and uh, they're, they're partially separable, but not fully separable. Uh, and this is no, really no different from a trade negotiation. You know, you have, uh, you have different components, but it, uh, in the shop-worn phrase at the end of the day, um, you have to uh, find a way to, uh, to, to build a composite proposal that reflects the, uh, both the trade-offs and the uh, complementarities between the different elements. And uh, Robin and I felt that it was uh, wrong, fundamentally wrong, uh, 
to try to uh, discuss these issues without creating a set of policy papers that were sort of linked at the margin, but which took up these various issues of the commodity titles, biofuels, and um, trade uh, in, a, in a way that recognized that they're at least partially separable. So that's, that's been our approach. There is no gee whiz solution, you know, to these, to these rural development and agricultural policy proposals. I mean, farm savings accounts, sorry, you know, they're not going to cut it. Uh, and uh, nor is any other singular uh, proposal of that kind. I think that for the most part that those proposals are gimmickry. That's my view. Uh, you know, this is a complicated process and it involves a lot of different uh, related moving parts. I know you didn't say that. By the no, way. no, no. And, and actually, my answer, as, as somebody who sort of watches things and looks at things from a political perspective and the dynamics of combinations and how do you put them together, uh, you know, my perception, you, you have the, you have the, you know, a constant explainable phenomenon on the Hill, which is that the Agriculture Committee is self-selected to include people who care about that, it, you know, and, and my, my sense has been until you get, you know, I was particularly listening to your comments about reformers and whether the reformers are going to come outside the committees and, and you know, in my sense is, you know, unless and until you get an, an organized, coherent reform initiative that includes all the people who frankly don't care about what happens to the commodity programs and they manage to succeed in winning that, winning the day in that process, you may not get the substantial reform you're talking about because I'm not so sure it can come from within that process that sort of looks at it and uh, does the careful well, thinking and that's bad because you may wind up with something that's not good for U.S. foreign policy and the problem you say that it was meant to solve, think, but think, it may start addressing the other issues. I think we agree. As far as I recall, uh, the last time that uh, anyone found a seat on the Ag Committee that really didn't belong there was when my friend Al Lowenstein was appointed to the Ag Committee by <laughs> Chairman Pogue as punishment for his recalcitrance. Is this a two-handed intervention, well, Ed? And then we'll go to the gentleman at the end. Well, I was just going to say two things. Um, I had lunch today with one of the reform groups um, and uh, one of the comments that they made was a quote from a senior Democratic staffer who said incredulously that recently that farmers were acting just like every other special interest in town. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently hadn't dawned on him before that. Um, you know, Having been around the, the reform community quite a bit in the last year and a half, um, you know, and it links back into the biofuels debate. I mean, one of the things that, that did link all of these reform groups together was the prospect of a big pot of money that they could share. Um, you know, the deficit reduction groups would get a certain amount and nutrition and whatever. Well, ethanol means that that pot no longer exists. And so all of a sudden, the one thing that they agreed on, which was we need to get more money out of Title I, had disappeared. And um, you know, even though you can make a good case that extending the current programs leaves you with an upside risk of around 30 to $35 billion a year, that's not real in anybody's calculations. And so I, I do, there are some, you know, maybe Farm savings accounts are a bit of a gimmick. I'm not sure everything that they're Maybe talking I am about. Is, but but I think the fact that there's <laughs> there's you know there's just not the pot of money available that all these reform groups thought was going to be there to divvy up. And I'll just make one other comment on the um, question about the rural um, reformers, and I think it applies to a lot of the reform groups. Is that um, while all of these groups, I think, do see and understand the broad picture, I mean, I think if you talk to them, the nutrition community does and the rural guys do, um, at, there is some price at which they will be happy with, um, you know, $500 million more for food stamps or rural development block grants or whatever it is. And, you know, we haven't really gotten past that. I mean, we can say parenthetically that in terms of farmers being an interest group, I somewhere still have my 1980s era faith, hope, and parody button. So <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman at the end, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Janet Hinman, uh, uh, Social Security Administration, also the Corps of Engineers. 
But uh, quite a while ago, I was uh, really interested. I, was, I did work in renewable energy and sustainable development. And you've been talking some about. Uh, I I got particularly interested in biomass energy systems and fuels and chemicals from biomass. And you've been talking some about sort of the collision of um, of food uh, uses of biomass for food and, and for for fuels and chemicals, and also about something I was curious about, which is the overuse you know, the overuse of the land and having to like over over fertilize it and over chemical it. Um, there were there were some systems that I had sort of lost track of their development, but one of them, um, there was a real interesting. Uh, there, there was a uh, there were some plants which uh, uh, most plants uh, take carbon, uh, produce CHO combinations, carbohydrate combinations. A few plants that strip out all of the oxygen molecules and they make HC combinations, hyd hydrocarbons. And the heavy molecular weights are rubbers. The medium ones are like creosote and. Jojoba and the light ones actually uh, produce something very much like oil. That you could, it's, it's not economical, but you could actually just put it into a refinery, crush it, put it into a refinery and use it. They immediately ran into some problems though with them. They were almost all, at least several of them were dry country plants. In other words, if you went to uh, like produce a lot of them, like make a real farm and, and produce them in big numbers, uh, the, the roots rotted if you, if, you, if you watered them. I mean, you know, has anything, um, I mean, Guayule, the World War II rubber plant, was a, a dry country plant. They did manage to produce it in pretty good, you know, pretty good quantities. Are there any other of these systems uh, of biomass uh, uh, plants or uh, potential energy biofuels? Have any of the others made any ground, gained any ground besides ethanol? Are, are any of them likely to enter into the mix, or is it, or is eth ethanol the only? Uh, certainly, it's all it's all we've talked. It's all I've heard about for years. Are there any others that are likely to get anywhere? I can't answer that, but uh, how would one know so long as the um, structure of the subsidies are so heavily biased toward corn-based right. uh, alternatives? I mean, you know, we're set up for corn. 99.9% .9 of the ethanol that's being produced is from corn. Number two, yellow corn, once it's been grown and dried, uh, you know, we have a, a logistical network is in place to, to move it around the country already. So we have all these things. Um, but uh, I would say that we really don't know what else we might do uh, because uh, the whole system is sort of rigged at the moment toward corn-based ethanol. Um, although, so someone said to me, that I've been working up at the our Cedar Creek Ecological Research Station north of the Twin Cities, and someone did remark, despite their work on cellulosic alternatives up there, that. Uh, ethanol, uh, cellulosic ethanol was going to be five years away 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, I think that, that that's kind of where we are today. Well, let me uh, call on the panel if they have any just last brief thoughts. Bill, let's start with you. Oh, let's end with me. I don't have any brief thoughts. I don't have any thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> <All> thoughts. <laughs> Forward any brief thoughts. 